Good afternoon and welcome to the 108 Harley Street CPD snippets. Some of you are already familiar with this uh, format. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we are aiming to run a number of uh, seminars like these, which will cover a wide range of uh, specialties and subjects. And we plan to talk for around one topic each time using a small 12 num slides only small number, keeping it short to 20 minutes so it's nice and easily digestible for everybody and hopefully, hopefully relevant and slightly even interesting and entertaining. Please do send us your feedback. Uh, and obviously, if you have any particular recommendations or ideas for the future talks, uh, please let us have your uh, ideas in the symposium at 108harleystreet.co.uk. There's your address. Now, in each talk, we also aim to, uh, we'll have a little slide, one or two slides, where this uh, key sign will appear on the left-hand corner. This is to just tell you that this is the key take-home message for the slide. So uh, I'm a colorectal surgeon and I uh, have been practicing colorectal surgery for 20 years and I'd like to talk to you about one condition, the pyelonatal sinus, which is an area of particular interest to me, um, probably uh, because I, it, it came to me, I was forced to deal with this really. Um, I call it the Cinderella because nobody's interested in this. And when I was first appointed as a consultant surgeon at St. Thomas 20 years ago, my senior colleagues approached me and told me that, uh, I mean, um, we don't like, this condition is terrible, we don't, I don't even deal with this anymore. Uh, you can have all of my patients and uh, they don't work anyway. Whatever you do, they fall apart and it's miserable and good luck, welcome on board. It was this typical scenario where I thought, well, how can this condition not uh, be treatable? The problem, as with anything else, is people fail to understand the pathology. And I went back to basics on this and uh, uh, looked at the etiology of pyelonatal sinus. It, it translates to nests of hair, but actually um, the problem starts from hair follicles that become damaged and get blocked. Now, um, it's not a cyst and it should not be called a pyelonatal cyst. A cyst is a structure which has a a capsule and a membrane around it containing a material. This is literally an, uh, a cavity with an opening to at one end. So it's a blind ending cavity. And once these hair follicles get blocked, uh, they cannot drain, they become infected and they swell and form little abscesses and they rupture. When they rupture, you end up with these tiny little pits, as you can see in this photograph, these little pits, because they don't, they, they fail to heal. Now, the actual nest of hairs is a secondary phenomenon and uh, I'll show you some photos in a moment but uh, typically loose hair from the buttocks or actually hair from the back of the head in a number of individuals can track along here and get stuck in the natal cleft and if you've ever seen a hair follicle it's got little barbs on the microscope tiny little barbs that point downwards and as the buttocks grind together and rub together in day-to-day -day activities, sitting down, walking and such, these hairs are pulled in and, and drawn into the buttocks and literally uh, the barbs latch on and more and more hair gets drawn in. Once the hairs get inside, you get this little bulgy sort of sinus cavities formed and this leads into episodes of intermittent inflammation, chronic infections, etc. So, and there's some sort of evidence, the same patient over there, you see the pits there with the ex external opening and this little bulgy area. At operation, there's that external opening, we're now looking at it in sort of a cephalocodal direction up and down. There's the pits are here and there's this little bunch of hair stuck in there. Um, is hair essential? Well, hair is probably ever present, uh, uh, but it's not the only uh, problem. It's one element of this condition. You can get hair from the local area, as I said, or loose hairs from the back of the scalp. Um, and we know that removing hair by laser depilation does alter the natural history. It reduces the uh, recurrences. Um, but the problem, as I started looking into this, I was trying to find a solution for these non-healing uh, difficult issues, was uh, why is there that uh, pyelonatal sinuses are so common in the sacrococcal area Whereas uh, anywhere else in the body, you rarely ever see them. Uh, I remember in medical school, we were taught that you can get pyelonatal sinuses 
around the digital web spaces. I don't know if anyone's ever seen one of these. Uh, supposedly barbers get them, other uh, their clients' hairs get caught between the webs and produce them. We do see them um, in umbilical uh, pyelonal sinuses, and apparently at picanthic folds, I've never seen one of those around the eyes, presumably eyelashes dig in and produce it. But the fact remains, the vast majority of cecococcygeal. And uh, the reason for this is that this particular area, uh, and of course, uh, the actual uh, common factor for all of these areas is the fact that you've got an invaginated cleft where hair can, debris can get stuck in. But why the cecococci is so prominent, uh, so, uh, uh, more, so much more common, is because you've got a specific, a particular environment and which presents a number of challenges to healing and lends itself to this condition to be formed. So in uh, teenage years, probably just post-pubescent uh, young uh, teenagers, uh, probably have this uh, hair burrowing in, producing this uh, problem in an area where you've got a deep cleft, so there's already room for hairs to lodge in, plus it's anaerobic in the sense that the buttock cheeks come together and you've got a sort of a, I'm afraid, a sweaty, smelly uh, teenage um, bump crack, uh, which doesn't lend itself to healing if you've got an infection. It's close to the anus and uh, if anyone's got teenage children, I'm sure their hygiene and things needs to be, uh, you are aware of how much they sort of lend, uh, sort of, uh, how well they maintain their hygiene. Um, and one other problem is that you've got hardly any subcutaneous tissue in the midline of natal cleft. You've got this lovely buttock round cheeks, uh, especially in, in teenagers where it's sort of more rounded and gluteal muscles well developed. Uh, but in the middle, there's a bony sort of coccyx or sacrum. So anything that breaks the wound and penetrates it, it's got a bit of fascia and then straight to bone. So there's not much room for uh, problems. It starts spreading sideways. Uh, and of course, the buttocks are always in use, walking, sitting, running, jogging, whatever you do, um, it leads to this problem. So this is the sort of the key message here that you've got this environment that lends itself to the problem, a deep cleft, an anaerobic area, no cushion, no padding, and proximity to the anus. So whatever you aim to, whatever treatment that's designed uh, is trying to address these things. Uh, but the unfortunate and the sad uh, thing um, is that even in year 2020, when we've known about this for a long time, a, a significant proportion, in fact, more than half the UK surgeons and in the region of 60, 70 percent of uh, European surgeons in recent uh, uh, survey uh, only know one thing and they don't quite understand the pathology. They have one technique which when it goes wrong, they call it, well, it's the problem, is the condition, is the patient, it's the fact that they've got uh, comorbidity or whatever. Uh, the aim of any treatment is to uh, eradicate the infection and try and achieve a closure with the minimum morbidity and crucially to stop it coming back. And if you look at the number of operations that have been designed, um, more than 60, maybe a lot more than that, I don't really know. I mean, I literally was counting how many I can name, um, ranging from very simple to complex. It suggests that there's a problem in that we don't really quite know and there's no consensus because everybody has been taught one way by their own boss and then I go on and carry on doing the same wrong thing with increasing confidence and call it experience. So um, decades of literature have shown poor data and we've really not come to the bottom of this, no puns intended. And unfortunately, as I said, the vast majority of surgeons, even in UK, it's very, very, very sad to see, will still carry out this procedure called the wide excision only, which if you've got a young adult with this kind of multiple discharging points and swelling and abscesses, when you cut it out, you're left with this great big hole in here. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, <clears throat> I don't believe anybody wants one of these. <clears throat> to be there, uh, to be treated as their definitive treatment. Um, people, and this is what my colleagues, when they approached me when I was first appointed as a young consultant said, look, I mean, it's a safe procedure, it never gets infected. Yes, wounds get colonized, but you don't get any problems really. The fact is that 
majority of these patients are in pain, it's uncomfortable, the bone's exposed, and it takes literally months, not weeks or days, months for these to heal. They need often daily dressings, it's not fun. And if you're a teenager or a college student or a young adult in your 20s, you really want to get on with life. You don't want to be dealing with this kind of uh, daily nurse dressings, daily um, uh, uh, pain. And as you see, at the end of the day, about a third of these or more will fail. So people then refer you to a plastic surgeon or somewhere else, more, more uh, uh, specialist, and they come along with this very fantastic idea of vacuum assisted closure, uh, negative pressure dressings. Now, can anybody please tell me, is there any single individual in this world who will be happy to carry one of these stuck with a bump crack for the three months or so? Um, it's not fun. No young adult wants to do it. They can't have a relationship. They can't have any personal close contact uh, with a partner. It's impossible. And the Cochrane analysis that looked at this two years ago, three years ago, looking at the two only randomized trials, showed that it only uh, gave benefit of extra three or four days quicker healing. So from 90 days on average healing to 86 or seven days healing, which is ridiculous. Why would you carry this around with you? You might as well have a horrible smelly dressing. So this is not the answer. So then I looked at uh, the other option. One of my colleagues who was a bit more uh, uh, forward thinking said, listen, you can just go them. Well, why don't, if, as long as they're not infected, just close the damn thing. And I said, OK, um, why have you got so many recurrences then? And the problem is quite when you look back, it's obvious, but if you've got a wound in the midline, you've got two buttocks and a wound in the middle, you're going to have shearing forces, you're going to have tension. You can't just leave a hole that size, which we've just seen over there, and try and approximate the edges together. It's going to end up breaking apart. It's going to sort of, the wound's going to come apart, the healing's going to be uh, affected, and you're going to be left with another open wound. So back to square one with an open wound. And this I don't want to show you any data or anything because it's boring. What I really want to show you is that number there. Look, the date of this study was 1975. 45 years ago, someone called Sudet Al in a plastic journal, which nobody clearly has paid attention to, wrote up a series of decent comparative trial of when you incise and drain it and abscess, you get 60% recurrence rate, appalling. If you, in other words, you haven't actually dealt with the disease. If you just excise and lay open, you think you've cut the disease out and just pack it, 30% or so come back. If you excise and primary closure, which is the one we just talked about, the tension I think results in a third to break down. But if you did something very simple as a Z plasty, which changes the contour, gets rid of the deep cleft, you end up with no recurrences. And that was 45 years ago we knew this. And to this date, in Europe and in UK, we're still doing these primary uh, laying opens. We're terribly bad at this. We're opening them up, leaving them open, or we're doing primary closures. It's pretty much now accepted amongst surgeons who are interested in parallel surgery. Sad, sad ones like me, and there are a few sad colleagues of mine who sit there talk about parallel sinus that this is an unacceptable way of treating. You shouldn't just lay open, leave it open, and you should not close down the middle. What you can do, what is a good procedure, is if you've got your cleft in here, and there's your disease, if you were to convert this by taking the extra skin from the side and then approximating the buttock cheeks together, first of all, there's your sacrum and coccyx. You've got a nice big pad of wad of fat on top of the bone, which is wonderful cushion, a nice big of padding. So you don't have a wound at the base down there next to the bone with no covering. Secondly, you can use the extra skin from the other side to close this wound sideways on the, away from midline. And then you've got two reasons why things succeed. First, a padding of tissue, which has got a lovely immune uh, function. It resists infection, plus a wound that's away from the midline, and look at the shallowness of the cleft. It's smoothed this up so you don't have the deep cleft, and cosmetic results are not bad either if you look at this. This is one of the ones I did on a patient with a relatively simple sinus. Uh, the beauty of this procedure is very, very successful. It has minimal pain, 
Uh, very manageable by simple analgesia, usually non-steroidals and paracetamol, and good cosmetic outcome, minor morbidity. The problem is it does require technical, it's technical because it needs to be trained and be taught. And I'm afraid the old days where you see one, teach one, do one and all that are gone, or to be left with an oh, just get on with it, it's just a final sinus. You need to teach someone and you need to find a surgeon who's been taught to do it. So it's very sad that this day and age, the problem we've got with this is we can't find a surgeon who does this. In fact, in UK, I think about less than 10 of us do these procedures. So um, when I was uh, coming up the ranks uh, as a new consultant surgeon, I thought, you know what, I've seen all these various techniques of doing them. I'm going to, my quest was set. I was going to be the guy who systematically obliterated these young college students' natal clefts. I was literally going around removing natal clefts, flattening everyone's bum. And I used every technique in my uh, in my possession. I used the Limburg flap uh, from a Russian uh, um, plastic surgeon, Alexander Limburg, which gives this rhomboche flap. Uh, I used the Z-plasty, which we should we discussed about. I used the Karadakis procedure, which is probably one that's most commonly produced. And this is a, a Greek chap whose uh, first paper was 6,000 of these. Now, he's even sadder than I am. He did 6,000 of these in the 1990s, and he had about 2 or 3% recurrences. Uh, to the cleft relief, which you saw, which is a nice simple one, or these really nasty ones, multiple recurrences. This patient had eight operations. I removed the whole surgery, and his, his infection was going right down to the anus, as you saw in one of the early on pictures, with that wound entering the anus. And you can simply just divert the wound away. Now, you might think this isn't very nice, or this is nice, or this is not nice, but patients love you for it. They've had six years of an open wound or eight months of a smelly wound. So they don't care what it looks like. So you, you can choose your flap, whichever you like it. And there's a hundred thousand of them written. But I would suggest keep it simple. And so that's when I prefer to do patients. I give them, uh, I do the simple ones. It's quick. It works very nicely. But sometimes you need to do some of this because you've got a very broad uh, disease. You almost never need to go near a plastic surgeon with graft and things. This is terrible. And I can show you pictures. I'm not going to there. No need for it. It's a sledgehammer to crack a nut. You can deal with these without them. Um, the thing they have in common, all of them are flattened the cleft. They've made the wound away from the midline, all of them. And you've got no chance of this recurring. And they are all quite successful. So key and final slide. Palerano disease is a real pain in the backside, a proper pain in the butt. And poor young people suffer this. They, their work is compromised. Their studies are compromised. They hate visiting doctors. They don't want multiple operations. So you've got your principles, but to prevent recurrences, stay out of the damn hairy ditch that's there already and make your wound away from the midline. Take away that natal cleft, eliminate it. The quest has been achieved. And uh, I have had good success and a lot of very happy patients because of this. In my second talk, I kept it two sides. And in my second talk, I'm going to show you the times when they've gone wrong, either in my hand or others, and how I corrected those and the principles of that. And I hope you'll join us to see that one because uh, that's the sort of thing you will see a lot in your practice as general practitioners where patients turn up with open wounds and uh, uh, kind of the surgeon who's done it wants to do that kind of ignore, I don't want to see this patient again, send it to the GP, manage the wound, more dressings and such. So please join us and I can show you what to do with those. It's very simple.